Coming up, two museums, one complete with dinosaurs, the other devoted to JFK. Also, Blues Masters at the Crossroads in Salina. And an urban educator who inspires her peers. It's all next on The Local Show. Principal funding for The Local Show provided by Francis Family Foundation, Frederick and Louise Hartwig Family Fund, Kaufman Foundation, Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Johnson County Community College, John and Effie Spees Memorial Trust, Bank of America Trustee, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Commerce Bank Trustee, and KCPT members, thank you. And I'm Nick Haynes. Could you be experiencing a night at the museum in Overland Park sometime soon? If you've been near 135th and Knoll lately, you've probably noticed the progress being made there on the massive new Museum of Prairie Fire. It will be the first venue to continually host exhibitions from the American Museum of Natural History in New York, where the popular Night at the Museum movies are set. The Museum of Prairie Fire is scheduled to officially open in May, but a temporary exhibition space is now open in the museum's shadow. I got a chance mm. to uh, check out its new dinosaur exhibit and meet with its brand new executive director, who just left her post at the prestigious New York Museum to take on this new assignment. Thigh bone of a dinosaur. Thigh bone of a 60 foot long sauropod, to be exact, a humongous plant eating dinosaur that is thought to have roamed the earth for 140 million years. It's the star of the first American Natural History Museum exhibit in Overland Park. There's plenty to touch, push, and pull here. You even get to see inside the dinosaur's huge belly, and thanks to rumble seats that move and shake, you get to feel its every breath. What if this was a living creature and we'd sit here? We'd be scared. Well, we wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> we'd be, be riding as fast as we could. <laughs> Yuli, of all the cities you could have partnered with, why Overland Park? The museum has a large content dissemination program that's, uh, I think, the largest in the world, as a matter of fact. What that means is the museum itself creates exhibitions, planetarium shows, science video, a whole uh, broad range of uh, content products. And that program was doing splendidly, was growing, uh, was having you know, uh, partners on five continents but uh, it was looking for ways to maybe partner with different kinds of organizations. At the same time, some folks right here in the community in Overland Park at Merrill Companies were developing a very innovative and visionary concept for a mixed-use project. And they decided they wanted to have a civic amenity in the project, maybe a library, maybe a museum, you know, something like that. And through, I'm gonna say, serendipity, you know, snowball principal, uh, we got to talk, uh, they called us, we got on the phone, I still remember the first conference call, and so over several months we worked out this partnership. What about other places though in our metropolitan Kansas City area? Union Station, for instance, would have killed for this exhibit. Did you ever go to them first? They would have loved this. Well, uh, this is how the deal came about. So we were approached by Merrill Companies and, and uh, that's the deal, uh, you know, that we made. How about other cities like Chicago and San Diego and San Francisco? Have they been approaching you and saying, hey, you know, why did you come to Overland Park? Why didn't you come to us? Um, we've been approached by you know, a few parties that were interested. I think it's likely that there will be similar opportunities, but uh, to my knowledge right now, this is the only project of its kind. It's, it's really unique in that way and really uh, pioneering. Well, Nick, the other thing I wanted to show you is how much did one of these creatures need to eat in a day? Tell me. All right, well, take a look at this. We're telling Holy, you. that's one dinosaur? That is one dinosaur in one day. And wow. Just, I saw this earlier. I thought we were actually going to be climbing into this. This was like a kid's uh, little kid's <laughs> little activity. A little interactive. And the other thing is, you know, they didn't actually chew this, and I don't recommend this to children <laughs> to imitate, but they didn't chew. They just tore it off and put it right into their stomach, and that's where it got digested. 
because, you know, if you had to chew this amount of food, you would never get done in a day. This is the temporary exhibit. What will visitors be able to see when the total museum opens then in May? There will be a new American Museum of Natural History exhibition every six months. So, you know, you can come back at least twice a year and know that, yeah, that you have a full-scale exhibition that's completely new. So to give you an example, the museum itself will open with an exhibition entitled Water, H2O equals life. Then there will be an exhibition called Mythic Creatures that will focus on uh, dragons, unicorns, and mermaids. In addition, there will be a discovery room, which uh, is essentially a uh, attraction that targets children age three and up and their caregivers. A Tyrannosaurus Rex mount in there. And we will be telling the story of Tyrannosaurus Rex, which is a story of Kansas, as I think, I think a lot of people don't know. So uh, to fill you in, uh, the gentleman that discovered uh, the first uh, remains of T-Rex was called Barnum Brown, after P.T. Barnum, and he was quite a character. Um, and he was born in Carbondale, Kansas. Um, became, uh, well, learned how to find fossils, you know, in his childhood and then became probably the best known fossil hunter of uh, his time of the late 19th, early 20th century. And later on, he moved on to have a position at the American Museum of Natural History, believe it or not. For many of our viewers, their introduction to the American Museum of Natural History is that uh, movie with Ben Stiller, who's that night watchman, and all of the artifacts come to life, a night at the museum. Will you be having a night at the museum at your new museum of Prairie Fire? We are definitely planning on having a sleepover program at the Museum of Prairie Fire, um, you know, where you can come and explore the museum after hours when it's dark and uh, get excited about all the content and you're able to sleep there on a cot. Whether the exhibits really come to life after midnight, you know, you'll just have to come and see for yourself. This is so not worth 11.15 We move now from a very public museum to a story about a more personal one. As this month marks the 50th anniversary of President Kennedy's assassination, we take you back to Overland Park to meet a man who, since childhood, has collected all things JFK. From buttons to banners to masks and even a famous wedding invitation, his basement collection is almost a museum in itself, as John McGrath and Lindsay Fote discovered. My name is Rick Kaplan and I collect JFK memorabilia, and I've been collecting it for over 50 years. Okay, so let's go down and check it out. Let, I'll invite you to my shrine uh, or museum, All right. as I'd like to think of it. I start his, the, my collection with the items from the uh, Democratic National Convention in Los Angeles in 1960. This is the rarest of all JFK magazines. It's the first magazine that he ever appeared on, and that was in um, November of 1946, which would have made him 29 years old. So this is considered the most valuable and rare of all the magazines. Another big thing I cover is the debates. This poster was put out by Sylvania, and it was the, it's considered the first poster since um, the JFK debates were the first debates, and it was put out by Sylvania to advertise their silver screen 85 picture tube. This case is the one that the first two shelves are devoted to the assassination. These are some very rare items. Um, one of the more interesting items is this one right up in front, which, which is that on the day that JFK was assassinated, the ticket says, breakfast with President and Mrs. John F. Kennedy, Friday, November the 22nd, 1963, at the Grand Ballroom in the Hotel Texas, sponsored by the Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce. And I think that's really one of the coolest items that, that, that there is because for $3, you could have breakfast with him on the day he was assassinated. I think this is a real nice item. It's an invitation to JFK and Jacqueline's wedding on September the 12th of 1953. These are called gift prints, White House Christmas gift prints. And this is the 1961, 1962, 
and 1963 gift prints. These were not what they would give to donors. Uh, you know, they might send them a Christmas card. They would only print roughly 2,000 to 2,200 of these, and they would give them to staff and important people. I, I have uh, about a half a dozen American newspapers showing that J yeah, on the day of the or day after the assassination. A couple interesting ones. I have one from Hamburg, Germany, from Scotland. Then I have a magazine from uh, Paris, France on the assassination. This is the uh, program from Shawnee Mission North High School in 1958 when JFK came to uh, speak on behalf of uh, the Democratic candidate for the second congressional district, Newell George. The, uh, the program is autographed by JFK, which makes it especially unique and valuable. This is the actual poster from a movie theater advertising PT-109 with Cliff Robertson that, that JFK, uh, you know, depicted hit the PT-109 adventure. And these are lobby cards that were actually out in the lobbies advertising the JFK movie. Again, I really appreciate you coming out and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed it. I think it encompasses his political career pretty much from 1960, from the Democratic National Convention through the assassination and beyond. Many different commemorations of John Kennedy's life coming up this month, including Public Television's American Experience special, JFK. You can see it Monday, November 11th at 9 p.m. on KCPT. Here in town, a free event, an evening with Jack Kennedy, is being presented at Shawnee Mission East High School on Saturday, November 16th. Last week, UMKC launched the Urban Education Research Center. One of the main goals of this new endeavor will be to collaborate with schools and share insights from local educators who have done their job particularly well. One of those people, someone they expect to look to often as a prime resource, is the subject of this profile from education reporter Lindsay Fogt. Some people are coming in. Good morning. Can you say good morning? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. When children come in in the morning, we want them, we, you know, we, say, we greet them and say, good morning. Hello, it's going to be a great day. You know, let's go to breakfast. And we do that because it sets the tone. This is the way Dr. Jessie Kirksey, or Dr. K, as she is known to staff and students at John T. Hartman Elementary School, has greeted students every morning ever since she became a principal over 38 years ago. I started in 1966 as a teacher at Longfellow Elementary School, 2830 Homes, and I started as the first grade teacher. Having spent her entire career, nearly half a century, in the Kansas City, Missouri School District, Dr. K has learned more than a thing or two about urban education. I think when I first got out of college, I thought I had all the answers. I thought I was gonna be the best teacher. I thought I was the best teacher. I just knew I had the answers. But the more I stayed in it, I found I didn't have any, I didn't have any of the answers. You know, I didn't know anything. And as I, as I continue to, to work and grow, I, I, I'm finding out that we have to work together as a team. Working as a team and creating what she calls a professional learning environment for teachers is one of the main tenets of Dr. K's leadership. And it's working. Hartman Elementary has virtually no teacher turnover and the staff's average experience is 15 years. We have job embedded staff development where we take teachers in a classroom and we say, okay, we're gonna watch you in your in, uh, instructing. And then once you know, you're through, then we're going to kind of discuss what we saw. And if there were any concerns, then we're gonna discuss it, but we do it in a very friendly, non-threatening atmosphere. And they did that very well. Okay, thanks. I mean, one of the problems with schools is that they're kind of hermetically sealed. Classrooms are hermetically sealed. So I never see what anybody else does, and they never see what I do. And, you know, the idea that you can actually watch someone and learn from what they do, you need that. In addition to empowering teachers through collaboration, Dr. Foster hopes the center can help local schools and districts problem solve instead of attributing low achievement to a culture of poverty. I mean, it is a defeatist attitude in that it doesn't allow you to think you have any agency over the situation. Um, and I think so that's what they're saying. You know, we've got these outcomes, what would you expect? But of course it, it limits you because maybe if you've tried a different approach, you're not saying maybe it's the approach, 
that's interacting with this culture of poverty, but the approach is, is held harmless. I want you to dream a school how you want your school to be, and I want you to write down on this paper all your ideas about uh, dreaming a school. My school, my dream school. For almost as long as she's been a principal, one approach Dr. K has used is the principal's round table, where students that may need some extra attention are entrusted with leadership roles. No one rises to low expectations, you know. So no, I expect you to do this. You're the leader. Oh, you're gonna do this. And just you saying that to them, giving them that opportunity. I mean to tell you, they soar. Are they good on this one? Another way Dr. K empowers students is by letting them track their own progress with data books. As a school, Hartman Elementary is doing well on state measurements of student growth, and one of the district's top schools in terms of student attendance. We tell children, you have a responsibility. In other words, you are the CEOs of your learning, and you know, you're in charge. Despite many years of experience and accomplishments, Dr. K says that she still doesn't have all the answers. So now I know I didn't know a thing. And now I know I know I don't know a thing because I haven't gotten over there yet. I haven't reached it, but I'm still in the process of becoming. Mm -hmm. She may not think she knows everything, but what she does know will be happily integrated by UMKC's new Urban Education Research Center as they strive to improve the quality of education in the urban core. Reporting on education for KCBT, Lindsay Foth. Oh, good. Give me a hug, my leg. Oh, great. I, I, come on, give me a hug, and I'm going to be your best friend. One weekend a year, the elder statesmen of the blues and their followers converge in the middle of Kansas to celebrate a uniquely American art form. Salina is nearly a thousand miles from the cotton fields that inspired that music, yet Blues Masters at the Crossroads draws many of the singers, songwriters, and performers who helped shape the music. Reporter Julie Denache was on hand for this year's event. Even after 16 years of bringing blues musicians to the Great Plains, Salina, Kansas still seems an unlikely destination for the blues. But someday, songs may be written about meeting at the crossroads of 8th and Walnut, where crowds gather on the steps of a neo-Gothic church in downtown Salina. It's the third weekend in October, and they've come to worship at the altar of the blues. For Chad Kassam, who owns Blue Heaven Studios, it's more than just a weekend of concerts. It's a race to capture a sound that soon may disappear. For 16 years now, we've had the Blues Masters at the Crossroads here in Salina, Kansas, and my goal was to document the living blues legends while they were still with us and performing and try to document them in a very high quality so we could share them with the world so everybody could hear them at their greatest. It isn't until now that I realized just how urgent it was. I mean, I didn't realize they would be gone so quickly. Now looking back, 35 of them have passed away since we started doing this, if not more, of the performers that we've had. Uh, I mean, Gatemouth Brown, Little Hatch, Bobby Blue Bland. I mean, so many of the legends that were our friends and that we had here many times, Pontop Perkins, Robert Jr. Lockwood, they've all passed on. While many pioneers of the blues are no longer with us, Kassam believes that the musicians who remain deserve to be heard like Lazy Lester, who was inducted into the Blues Hall of Fame in 2012. I like to play music anywhere, anytime, for anybody. That's my thing. I mean, like I say, music is my business, business is my music, and music is my pleasure. Chad is on a one-man mission to record as many of the classic blues masters, as we call them, um, that are around. It's an exciting thing to be involved with, to, to be able to, to uh, sort of archive uh, some of the great works of, of these blues guys. 
Performing in a sacred space carries a special resonance for many of the blues artists, but for some, playing the blues in a church is still a little unusual. The first thing they say when they walk in, they go, man, this is a church. And I'm like, well, yeah, we, we told you it was a church. They go, no, no, but this is a church. And I'm like, well, what were you expecting? You know, a little house on the prairie, you know, like, you know, the little church with the steeple and all the people. A lot of people tell me, yeah, you playing in church, so what? <laughs> to each his own, this, he bought the church, and he turned it into what he wanted to, to turn it into. If you don't put a blue in it, it's no church no more. It's a beautiful venue. Uh, there's something about recording music in a large space that cannot be duplicated any other way. So the acoustics in here are very, very nice, very conducive to live music. And, and that's conveyed on the recordings. Songwriter Doug McLeod says preserving this music is important the because the themes of the blues are universal. When death calls your name, there ain't no such thing as the entitled few. Blues is about life, the basic human feelings. You want somebody to love you. You want to love somebody. You want some food on, on the table. You want a little peace of mind. You want your kids to be all right. Those basic feelings, I think, are going to be with humans forever. And that's what blues is about. I'm going to change my way of living. I'm going to join that church again. Hailing from St. Louis, Marquise Knox at 22 stands out among the veteran bluesmen. Despite his youth, he says he has a special connection to this music. To me, the blues is important because it was, a, it was a way of living, and it was also my family story was indeed the blues. So this is what makes me want to keep this particular music around because it was the first thing that we could do outside of working in the cotton field, and that was being a musician, so I got to keep it going. Kasim says his goal is to capture a sound that rivals a live performance. And for him, there is nothing finer than recording direct-to-disc beneath the 42-foot vaulted ceiling that soars above the sanctuary. Well, I'm standing in St. Louis with my suitcase in my hand. Doing direct-to-disc recording, it's a challenge because, you know, the artist has to